Aloha, my name is Michael Sukoff. I'm your host for Thinking It Through, a new bi-weekly show devoted to thinking about and discussing important issues and problems in the local, national, and international news. So welcome, everybody. Um, for my first guest of this show, I want to welcome George Howland, Jr. Uh, George is a uh, longtime friend of mine in the interest of full disclosure. He's also a uh, journalist, a father, and uh, he has uh, worked in the field of journalism for a number of years, including uh, uh, radio commentary, uh, print journalism, and uh, I will let him say whatever else he wants to say about himself. Welcome, George. Welcome to Thinking It Through. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited about this um, first in a series of what I hope will be dialogues with activists and others. Uh, as I said, this episode's discussion features George Howland. Uh, who is also, if if I'm not stretching it too much, George, uh, a former activist. Yeah, uh, very much so. Thank you. And we'll get into a little bit more of that uh, as the show proceeds. Uh, so uh, in this half hour show, uh, we hope to engage in a free flowing dialogue concerning two of the major existential threats humanity is currently facing, the climate crisis and Russia's ongoing war in Ukraine. And our discussion aims to explore answers to the following questions. Number one, what is critical thinking? What does it mean to think critically? And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, number two, what are some different ways in which people think about the two issues that I've mentioned? And what are some of the assumptions underlying the way that people think about these issues? And thirdly, how would one think about these issues critically? So uh, I'm, I just wanna say a little bit more uh, about the philosophy behind thinking it through. There are many complicated and difficult issues to wrap one's brain around in, in the world today. And we have so much information coming at us from so many different directions. Uh, but what we often don't have the time to do is not only hear what's or read what's coming at us, but to try and uh, examine exactly what's being said and what are the assumptions underlying what's being said, what's not being said, and to do that from a critical standpoint, by which I mean, number one, listening very carefully, um, identify some underlying themes and what the, the person or person's account of the issue that they're describing is, and to try and look a little deeper at those underlying assumptions about how those persons or people are understanding that issue. So in other words, it's to the, the, the takeaway of this show is I want to help all of us to begin to learn how to think critically about contentious issues in the world today. And I believe that this is one of the most important skills we can have as, as American, as well as world citizens. So, uh, uh, George, uh, I'm not exactly sure uh, because we didn't get a chance to talk live before we went on air, but is there anything else or more you'd like to say about yourself, your background, or even what might be of interest to you in talking about during our, our conversation today? Uh, well, I have I started out my political involvement in my teens uh, working against the war Vietnam. And uh, I also became very involved in anti-nuclear energy and anti-nuclear weapons activism in my 20s. And uh, it, I found it very hard to move forward in the world with this great existential threat uh, that we face in terms of nuclear weapons. And now, of course, in the last, and that, even at that time, we were aware that we were on a, a terrible uh, trajectory in terms of um, environment, the environment and the destruction of the biosphere. And that, of course, has become even more acute in 
uh, the last 10 years as we have begun to learn uh, about climate change and, and begun to see the real effects of it. Great, George. Uh, well, I just want to add a little bit by way of background. Uh, uh, George and I have known each other since 1981. And what's very interesting and led me to be so excited about having you on today as a guest, George, is that I also, going back uh, even earlier than 1981, I was very concerned about a threat of nuclear weapons and nuclear war. And um, uh, George and I met, uh, I won't go into the details because we don't have time, but we formed a support group around uh, discussion and supporting each other around what to do in facing these kinds of global threats. And as you correctly mentioned, George, uh, the focus at that time for us and also in the, in the, in the major mainstream media was uh, the, the nuclear threat. Uh, you had a huge military buildup, nuclear weapons buildup between the arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union. And so you and I, George and I, came together uh, around uh, trying to get a handle in a group setting about, well, first of all, how do we take in what's going on in the world and, uh, and how does that affect us as individuals as well as a, as a group? Um, so I, uh, you have anything else you want to add to what I said, George? Well, I think you've summarized it very well. Well, thank you. Um, so I want to move into the specific issues uh, that uh, we identified at, at the top of this broadcast, uh, 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 cl the climate crisis and uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, and I, as we continue with what I hope will be a dialogue, uh, uh, we, I, 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 we would like to highlight the differences as well as the connections between these two issues. So, um, George, uh, what, what would you say about the way that you think about the, the nuclear weapons issue uh, that is either similar to or different from when, you and, when we first met? The biggest development in um, nuclear weapons uh, in the last 30 years has been, of course, the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, the Cold War that was being fought between the United States and the Soviet Union uh, threatened the entire uh, biosphere and potentially uh, could kill off uh, humanity altogether. Uh, this mutually um, assured destruction of MAD um, that the Soviets and uh, the Americans were pursuing uh, eventually turned into um, a, a really mobilizing issue for a whole generation of activists. Can I interrupt you for a second, just in the interest yeah. of time? Uh, I'm more interested right now in how your thinking about the issue has changed. And let me just add before, before, before you go on that uh, I, I'm bringing this issue in kind of through the back door and it wasn't uh, one of the two issues that we identified at the top. But the reason why uh, we thought this was such an important issue to bring up because the, uh, the Russian war and intervention in, in Ukraine has bought, brought front and center the possibility of the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, if things should really go in a in a in a in even worse direction than they've already been going, so I'm sorry. Go ahead, George. So, uh, with the end of the Cold War and the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, there was hope uh, on the part of many people around the world that um, maybe the nuclear arms race uh, could finally uh, end, and we could take in. Uh, undertake the end of um, the stockpiling of, of nuclear weapons and the production of more and more and more. Unfortunately, um, that didn't happen, both because of the um, 
unwillingness of the United States to engage in any kind of uh, real uh, anti-nuclear diplomacy under Republican and Democratic administrations. And then, of course, the development of uh, a very authoritarian system uh, in Russia uh, that eventually gave rise to uh, Vladimir Putin and his um, lack, complete lack of interest in any kind of uh, uh, nuclear negotiations. Uh, as he has pursued this strategy of intense aggression against Ukraine, as you said, uh, we're now back uh, to uh, one minute to midnight again. Uh, that was something that the uh, Union of Concerned Sciences uh, uh, did with the nuclear clock uh, th throughout the Cold War, pointing out that mm, we were in great danger. And that danger continues today. And how would you how would you say that your perspective on this issue, as you just uh, summarized it, um, your way of thinking through the issue compares with or is different from, say, the coverage of of the the Russian war against Ukraine right now? Because what I'd like us to get at is what are some of the assumptions behind the way you and I, you you know we you you and myself or even uh, the news media uh, portray what's going on in, in the war uh, the Russian war against U Ukraine for example do you see any uh, differences there and what I'm trying to get at is um, in the short time we have what does it mean to think critically about any kind of issue whether it's uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the danger of uh, nuclear confrontation. W what does it mean to sort of question the way the issues are maybe being presented to us, either through the media, through the words of Joe Biden, or through an anti-nuclear activist, for example? Well, Mike, it sounds like to me maybe that you have an answer to that question more than me. <laughs> well, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm I'm uh I don't want to uh what I want to do is engage in a dialogue around this. Now, I I will say a little bit more. Uh and maybe that'll help to move our our conversation forward. Uh on the issue of Ukraine, for example, most of the mainstream news media coverage, and I'm talking about CNN, MSNBC, even the PBS NewsHour, all of the major news outlets through which people in this country and even abroad get their, quote, news, unquote. There seem to be certain assumptions that are built in to the way these issues are being presented. For example, um, the question, and I, I do not at all condone Putin's horrible invasion and war against the Ukrainian people. This is absolutely inexcusable. These are war crimes. Uh, but what the question, one question that doesn't get asked very much, if at all, in my observation of, of, of the, the media is, how did we get to this point? How did we get to this point? And what's often not talked about is that uh, at the end of the Cold War and the breakup of the former Soviet Union, there were discussions between, I guess at that point it would have been, you know, the, the newly forming Russian government and the NATO countries, including the US, um, around what to do with Germany. Because Germany was divided into East and West Germany. And there's a whole history to that, which we don't have time to go into. But as a condition of allowing Germany to be become one country, the NATO countries, including the US, verbally agreed 
that NATO would not expand one inch further east. Now, that seems to be completely, maybe not forgotten. I mean, there are people who know this. But when stories about Ukraine, even background stories about how did this transpire, this is rarely mentioned, if at all. So what I'm interested in doing and having a dialogue around this on this show is to start asking some of these, I don't know what you'd call them, deeper questions or critical questions, because a lot of the that I see of the limitations of our largely corporate news media is they don't give us a historical context for understanding what's going on. So that would be one aspect of thinking critically, in my humble opinion, would be to ask questions about, well, how did we get here in the first place? Um, and what are these assumptions? I guess in this case, the assumption would be it doesn't really matter what happened up until very recently because it's not getting it's not getting talked about largely so uh so this is part of the, and the other thing i mean by thinking critically is means in going to the root of a problem okay now um the word radical is a very problematic term because the way it's used in in everyday language and including the corporate media uh does not reflect its original meaning the 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 word radical originally came from the latin word radicalis which means going to the root of something so i think being able to think critically involves going to the root of an issue and that's what i think is sorely missing in our in our corporate news culture and even in in everyday life what do you think about any of that it's interesting um of course we have a situation where historically russia has felt um very um vulnerable uh to uh the united states and nato and has reacted um, defensively um, because of that. And that really shows the, the lack of diplomacy that the United States has been able to engage in. Um, but of course, the other side of it is, is that who knows if Putin would have been interested in any kind of diplomacy. I mean, uh, you know, he's interested in a completely totalitarian society that he controls uh, with tremendous wealth being cut up among his oligarchs, his friends, his circle, uh, kind of a kleptocracy where uh, the government um, exploits the people and the environment in order to enrich themselves. Mm -hmm. And the United States of course, uh, our political system has not put uh, hardly any um, emphasis on opening dialogue and, and, and real negotiations with Russia. Um, they've been cast in the mode of the um, uh, Soviet Union, uh, of the, the bad guys ever since the um, uh, beginning of the Cold War and the um, the end of World War II, and it's a very frustrating situation where the people of the world are being held hostage to two um, superpowers, uh, neither of which has any interest in um, dismantling militarism and uh, getting serious about uh, uh, ensuring uh, the security of the majority of the people in both countries through um, uh, reaching out 
uh, and and making real concessions uh, to one another uh, and starting down the path of, of mutual disarmament. Yeah, I just want to mention um, uh, our time. The end of this program is fast approaching. I think we've got about 10 minutes left, something like that. So uh, I want to quickly turn to the other issue that um, uh, we identified uh, uh, as uh, something that might be good to dialogue around. And of course, it's impossible to do justice even to one of these issues in 30 minutes. But anyway, um, uh, you may know that there was a UN report today that came out that warned you warned that humanity has less than three years to slash greenhouse gas emissions nearly in half in order to prevent the most cat catastrophic effects of the climate crisis. Now, this is this is not really news. Uh, every six months to a year, the, in the uh, UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has come out with reports like this with increasingly uh, uh, Grim uh, predictions if if the world's uh, major industrial powers don't take uh, steps very quickly to cut greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but I guess what I'm wondering on 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 a kind of issue like this, as with uh, the nuclear weapons threat of the uh, uh, early to mid 1980s, these 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 reports, and in this case. You know, this is uh, the consensus. This report is the consensus of the world's majority of the world's climate scientists telling us, look, uh, if governments don't act now to take uh, what would be drastic steps to reduce carbon emissions, it's going to be game over for the climate. Uh, and similarly, during the years of the nuclear weapons pro pro proliferation and the the nuclear arms race between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, uh, humanity was at that point on the brink of a different kind of catastrophe. So I guess my question is, um, what's missing in the, with this picture? How is it that these reports can come out and uh, leaders uh, of major industrial nations like the U.S., uh, like Russia, like Great Great Britain, can acknowledge these scientific findings. And same thing with our news media, but yet nothing changes. And uh, so how do we under, what, what's wrong with this picture? I'm wondering about your thoughts on that. In terms of climate change, um, while the science is, is very clear, uh, science doesn't uh, make policy in the United States and in other major industrial countries around the world. Uh, our political system is, of course, completely and totally uh, rotten uh, due to the uh, huge amounts of corporate cash that um, control our political parties, a Republican and Democrat. Climate change uh, it flies in the face, of course, of the petroleum uh, industry, and it is one of the, the major lobbies in the United States, one of the most powerful uh, group of businesses that uh, controls uh, how our politicians uh, behave, and they show no inclination to come forward and uh, do anything meaningful about it. I will give Joe Biden credit that in his budget, he did try to begin uh, the so-called green revolution of switching away from fossil fuels. But uh, his efforts were met with uh, uh, stonewalling by the Republicans, uh, apathy by the general public, and um, mostly silence by the Democrats. Thank you, George. Uh, we're gonna have to wrap up this conversation uh, but I guess the last thing I, I want to uh, raise for uh, our and our listeners and viewers' consideration is, given the enormity of these dangers and the way they're being presented to us, uh, how can we as, as not only activists but uh, 
critical citizens think critically about these issues so that we can feel like we can have a say in what happens with the future of this planet. I don't expect you to have an answer to that, but I at least want to raise the question. Right now, my view is 73 million people voted for Donald Trump in the last elections, and we're barely holding on to the basic democratic norms that we have. The idea that we're going to launch a people's revolution against climate change, I don't see it happening anytime soon. Well, on that uh, um, somewhat pessimistic, pessimistic Somewhat, note. extremely pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to thank, thank you, George. George Howland Jr. Jr. is a, a father, a, uh, a journalist. He's um, been a political commentator and an activist. And uh, George, I want to thank you so much for being on Thinking It Through. I hope we can have you back at some point. And um, thank you all for watching and listening. Um, uh, if you'd like to share any comments or questions about the show, you can reach me, uh, see if I can remember my new email, email address. Uh, I think it would be uh, my last name, Sukhoff, S-U-K-H-O-V, at Hawaii, H-A-W-A-I-I dot E-D-U, Sukhoff at Hawaii dot E-D-U. Uh, thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again here next time. Mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.